right. Hi, I'm Dr. David Tolk from Tolk Wellness and uh, Chiropractic and Wellness Center, and uh, I'm very excited to be uh, introducing Dr. Keith Jimenez. I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, Close enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and and the the wonderful part of uh, of us talking about with Keith today is we're going to be talking about Lyme and tick-borne diseases. And I'm really excited to be also introducing him into uh, joining the Tolk uh, Chiropractic and Wellness Center. So we're going to get started by uh, kind of talking uh, with Dr. Keith about Lyme disease, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Keith now. Okay. Well, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been practicing in the state of Connecticut since 2011. The last five or six years have been focusing primarily on Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. I do general naturopathic medicine also, but I've really kind of seized Lyme, Lyme as a uh, opportunity in, in Connecticut because it's such a major problem. And uh, we're gonna talk today about some prevention strategies, treatment strategies, different philosophical differences between the conventional medical approach and the naturopathic medical approach. And I think we can just jump right into it. Great, I'm, I'm excited. There we go. So these are the types of ticks we have in the US. Uh, the ones that we worry about most here in Connecticut are the black-legged tick and the brown dog tick. You'll also find uh, other varieties of ticks. I mean, they just have spread. So we started seeing some Lone Star ticks in uh, Connecticut recently, some of the Asian longhorn ticks, and they all carry different um, different combinations of tick-borne diseases. So the black-legged tick is the uh, the deer tick. That's the common deer tick that carries Lyme disease most frequently. Um, we've now identified the lone star tick uh, and the, the Asian longhorn tick, which carry different species of, of tick-borne diseases. The rickettsias that are related to the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, we're finding that now in Connecticut. So, and you can see on the right pictures uh, with identifying marks on these ticks. So here's our distribution maps. Uh, and you can see Lyme disease is, you know, some people think of it as a Connecticut problem or a New England problem. And it really isn't. It's, it's, uh, it's spreading all over the country now, pretty much any place that has grass. You know, you can just imagine uh, these things travel pretty easily. You have uh, the animals that carry the ticks, the mice and the deer which travel. You have people traveling. And um, these things have now have much wider reaching uh, uh, ranges than they did uh, 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Um, and you can see the concentrations of Lyme disease in the Northeast, the West Coast, and that pretty much follows for Babesia, which is a co-infection we'll talk about, Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, uh, slightly less common, uh, but still a concern, and we'll talk about those. So uh, the first question is, is how, how large is the scope of Lyme disease problem in Connecticut? So it's a major problem, obviously. Um, you know, the first thing is that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, there are about 30,000 cases of Lyme disease reported to them nationwide, uh, basically every year. Uh, but their estimates are closer to 300,000 cases. And that gets into, and these are some things we'll talk about, the challenges in testing uh, Lyme disease, underreporting of cases. And um, then specifically in Connecticut, the, uh, for the first time ever, the Connecticut Agricultural Experimental Station went out and collected ticks last year. It was the first time they've done that. There was some funding from the CDC kicked in and they tested about 2,500 ticks and almost half of them had Lyme disease and they collected them from all over the state. About 13% had Babesia and 9% Anaplasma. Those are the three uh, tick-borne bacteria they tested for. And uh, then 1% had Powassan virus, which is a newer tick-borne disease on the, uh, on the map, which is very, very concerning because we don't really have a treatment for it. So it's a major, major problem. I can just speak from personal experience in the last you know, five, six years since I've been doing this. I've seen hundreds of patients come in in various stages in their Lyme disease infections, and, uh, and the people are really hurting, and it's a, it's, a, it's a major problem here in Connecticut. 
Isn't that why we, isn't that, uh, isn't kind of Connecticut the epicenter of Lyme disease due to the fact that that's where we kind of, uh, the, where the name came from and things like that? Yeah, it originated in Lyme, Connecticut. There was uh, in the 70s, a mysterious arthritis that was affecting people. And uh, there are a lot of theories out there as to why it's become such a major problem in the last 40 plus years. But, uh, you know, there's there's a whole variety of, of factors there. But yeah, it, it originated in Lyme, Connecticut, and uh, was identified to be caused by the bacteria that we'll be talking about uh, today. And then here's a couple other distribution maps. We have ticks, tick borne relapsing fever, which is another species of Borrelia. So, Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease, Borrelia myomotoi causes the tick borne relapsing fever, and uh, they have similar. Um, similar symptom courses, similar ways you treat them. The TBRF can be a little bit harder to identify. The testing is, uh, is a little sketchy there, depending on, on where you go. And then Bartonella species, which are the, um, the cat scratch disease and the trench fever. You'll see those similar distribution, northeast, west coast, and then the rickettsia species. So rickettsia is the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, other spotted fevers around the world, and uh, not concentrated in the Rocky Mountains, but uh, we're, we're, we see a lot of cases that here in the, uh, in the northeast as well. So first thing is prevention. So when, you know, we all like to enjoy the outdoors um, here uh, in the spring, especially. And just another note about that, we expect a pretty bad tick season this year because, because it wasn't that cold the winter. So the ticks, they don't hibernate, they, they, they go dormant when the temperature gets below 45 and then they spring back out. So in order to prevent uh, getting ticks when you go out on a hike, play outside in the yard with the kids, um, you want to avoid the tall grasses, you want to tuck your pants into your white socks, you can see the ticks on you. There are a lot of tick repellents out there. There are um, companies that will come and treat your lawn. I don't recommend a specific one. And um, you just have to remember that ticks will hide in, in uh, areas where you can't find them. So in your hair folds, uh, skin folds, and that animals are a big hazard. So, you know, dogs are gonna go in and out, inside and outside, it's gonna pick up ticks. You're gonna wanna check it thoroughly as much as you can. Don't let it sleep in the bed. Kind of basic, uh, basic guidelines there. And there's a note about tick tubes here you can look up how to make those. They're basically, uh, you take a, uh, a toilet paper roll, empty toilet paper roll, put some permethrin on some cotton balls, stuff it in there, and the ticks will get the, or the, the um, it'll kill the ticks. It'll attract mice, it'll uh, kill the ticks and uh, keep them away from your, your yard. Yeah, the one thing I will say is this year I've been out in the woods throughout the whole winter and I found ticks on me uh, all every single month this year. Yeah, uh, between the dogs, it's, it's just not cold enough this year, so it's going to be a really bad year. It's going to be a bad season, and the ones you have to worry about are the are the, the tiny deer ticks. That's the yeah. really really concerning part. Um, when you do find a tick on you, remove it gently. Uh, don't try to stun it with fire or alcohol or hydrogen peroxide or any other chemicals. Uh, that's just going to cause the tick to release its, uh, it's going to freak the tick out basically and cause it to release its stomach contents into you. Don't grab it by the body, same thing. The bacteria that give us Lyme disease and, and, and all the other tick-borne diseases live in the stomach and they'll be ejected out if you're to, uh, to squeeze tightly. And then there's places where you can send your ticks off to. The um, Connecticut Agricultural Experimental Station, which I already mentioned, uh, that is the state testing facility. They'll test for three tick-borne diseases, and they do that for free. And there are also various websites. I mentioned Tick Report here, which will, for a fee, test for a whole gamut of, of tick-borne diseases, 20, mm -hmm. 25. And you, and you recommend this anytime that you find a tick on you to do this, or do you keep the tick and hang on and wait and see if you get a, a sickness or how, how do you, how do you play that key? Right. So, so basically, you know, the, the guidelines will say that a tick has to be 
uh, attached for a certain amount of time. The CDC says 36 hours in order to transmit disease. Not true. So if you find a tick that's embedded in you, remove it, send it off for testing. It's really up to you as, as to how you want to do that uh, through these various services. But I would say any any find anytime you find a tick on yourself or your family, you can uh, you you should go ahead and be proactive and send it off. So Lyme overview. So here are the, some of the symptoms. So we have kind of the classic early picture of, uh, of Lyme disease, which is the bullseye rash. So a note about the bullseye is that uh, it is the telltale sign. It looks just like a bullseye. And uh, unfortunately, not all Lyme rashes look like the bullseye. So a lot of different rashes can come from uh, the, uh, the, the Lyme disease. And then fatigue, aches, headache, a temperature in the afternoon or the evening, uh, that, is, that is a pretty telltale for, for Lyme disease. And then you move on after a course of maybe days to weeks to the joint pains, the arthritis, the headaches, the, the stiffness in the back of the neck, and then you have your late symptoms, which is from either untreated or undertreated or treated too late Lyme disease. You get the neurological symptoms and the heart involvement. Well, one of the things that I that I'm I'm aware of with uh, with the ticks is that it, you got to treat it right away because if it gets inside the cell membrane, it makes your life a lot harder to get to get rid of the the, the illness. Is that correct? That is very 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 correct, and and we'll we're going to get into that. But basically the best treatment is prompt treatment and treatment with antibiotics right away. I am a naturopathic doctor. I don't prescribe antibiotics. I can't here in the state of Connecticut, unfortunately, it's not part of my scope of practice, but prompt treatment with antibiotics is really the, the best measure you can take. You know, and, and that, and I'll, I'll kind of add a little bit as I've been, you know, been taking two rounds of antibiotics in the last 20 years and both of them are revolved around ticks. Otherwise, I don't really normally go towards antibiotics, but it, when it comes to tick-borne illnesses, I do not mess around. Yeah, you really can't. And there are also natural things you can do uh, to prevent the, uh, prevent the infl inflammation and the, uh, the infection from actually settling into your body and becoming a real problem. Wonderful. And, and uh, we're gonna keep moving on here. So what is, what is the post-treatment for Lyme disease uh, syndrome? So post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is the kind of conventional term for somebody who has Lyme disease. They're treated, but they continue to have symptoms six months later. So this is where you get into the controversy of chronic Lyme, which is what I would call it, versus post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So essentially, in the conventional medical community, you take the antibiotics and whether they give them to you for 10 days or 14 days or 21 days. And then if you're to experience any symptoms after the fact, six months later, they call that post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And really you shouldn't be treated for Lyme disease anymore, even if, if laboratory testing is showing that it's still in your system. I would call that chronic Lyme disease, that if, it's, if your body is still showing an immune response to it, it is appropriate to, to continue treating the Lyme. And uh, so that's where you get into the differences between post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome on the conventional side, chronic Lyme, and, and, and what I do. That makes better sense, yeah. So we're gonna go through a couple of the, the other uh, really common co-infections that we see. So Unfortunately, co-infections are the rule, not the exception. Uh, I would say that the majority um, of, of my patients who come up with Lyme disease also have one of these other infections because a tick, it's not just gonna carry one thing. It's gonna carry a variety of bacteria and viruses. And actually Babesia is a really common one that's a protozoa and Babesia, and the difference between a protozoa and a bacteria is not really important to this conversation, but Babesia is similar to malaria. So it lives inside of your red blood cells. It's an intracellular uh, parasite. And in the initial infection, it can be really nasty. It can cause 
uh, massive headaches and, and night sweats and can uh, even cause uh, a, a very severe anemia uh, that can, uh, you can end up in the hospital with. Um, and also uh, as it kind of goes on, so you see these kind of acute Babesia cases where it's really, really bad, but then some people are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms uh, with Babesia in the early course, but then as it becomes chronic, it becomes a major problem. And it basically it just finds this, this uh, happy spot inside your red blood cells, will uh, basically circulate around the body, cause kind of these persistent, uh, the night sweats will, will stay around, uh, muscle pains more than joint pains. And uh, essentially, all these co-infections will glom onto what Lyme disease is doing to your immune system. So it's the Lyme disease knocks down your immune system, in, inhibits the way that you're, you're able to fight off infection, and Babesia can just stick around for years and, and, made, and cause some major issues. So Bartonella is another bacterial illness. So this one uh, is either cat scratch disease, that's Bartonella quintana, and uh, Bartonella hensile, sorry, or trench fever, Bartonella quintana. So it's controversial uh, as to whether ticks transmit this one. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. Um, I would say most likely. You can also get this one from fleas. So cat scratch disease comes from the fact that you get scratched by a cat, the flea gets into the scratch, and then the Bartonella lives in the fleas and gets injected that way. Um, so what you see with Bartonella are very similar symptoms to Lyme. Um, so you see a lot of the same joint pains where the joint pains with Lyme tend to wander around from joint to joint. Uh, Bartonella tend to be uh, more uh, same joint on the on both sides of the body, bilateral, uh, can also affect uh, the heart. You see issues with the eyes and really, really common things that I see in my patients are mood changes. So that can be depression, anxiety, rage, irritability. Um, the headaches with Bartonella will tend to be front frontal, whereas with Lyme, they tend to be in the back. With Babesia, they tend to, to run up the shoulders to the back of the head. And, um, it also will glom on to what Lyme is doing to your immune system. Uh, a couple more we have to worry about here. We have mycoplasma pneumoniae. So this one is not tick-borne, but it is a, a co-infection nonetheless. So uh, mycoplasmas are airborne. This one specifically, there are other mycoplasmas, but this one specifically will come in through the respiratory tract. It will cause a mild uh, respiratory illness most of the time in severe cases uh, can cause walking pneumonia, a hospital, uh, you know, you, you end up in the, hospital, the emergency room. And uh, what we find in our chronic Lyme patients is this mycoplasma will be an issue if, it's, if, it, if it gets into the system, essentially, it will become chronic. And it causes, uh, it's a nutrient scavenger, it'll steal your nutrients. Uh, it'll cause the similar symmetrical joint pains to the Bartonella and uh, also brain involvement. So it'll get into the joints and the brain once it disseminates from the, the respiratory tract. Is, is that due to the fact that uh, your immune system's already uh, wound down? So anything that you're exposed to, you're gonna be more, more apt to, 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 to catch and, and they, these things will take over a little bit? Yeah, so you see that with a few of the other kind of Lyme associated illnesses is that the, uh, the immune system is knocked down and these other things get a chance to, to come out and, and, and wreak havoc. Okay. Is, is that also something that we have to be a little bit concerned with, with like the Corona, the COVID-19 right now, the immune system being down, would that be something that would tend to, people would, would you call that something that you'd be want to be, consider yourself high risk if you have Lyme currently? Uh, yeah, I've gotten a couple calls from my patients, my Lyme patients who work in the healthcare field in, in particular, and they're concerned about, you know, 
does my chronic Lyme make me more susceptible to COVID-19? And I, I don't see why not. I mean, it, it does make sense. Lyme trashes your immune system, stirs up inflammation, and uh, will make you susceptible to, to uh, both infections that are coming from outside the body and things that, are, that can potentially recur. And we'll, we'll talk about some, some of those things later. Okay. And then uh, anaplasma and ehrlichia, I don't see much of these because I, I think they're really hard to catch once you're past the initial phase of the, of the illness. So um, severe symptoms, very similar Lyme, but um, I don't have many people testing positive for these. Uh, and I, I don't think the testing is all that reliable once you get past the initial infection. Okay, Lyme testing. So we have a real problem with Lyme testing. Um, basically, the testing regimen that's been developed was codified in 1994 and hasn't been updated since. And the issue with Lyme testing is that we have a two-tiered system. So you first do a, uh, a Lyme screen test and it just gives you one number. It tells you, is your body making an immune response to Lyme or is it not? If that's positive, we go on and do the Western blot, which is a, uh, basically it's a, a deeper assessment of, of your immune response. So it's looking at different antibodies, different immune responses to different proteins on the surface of the bacteria that causes Lyme. Um, and it's really the only infection that we test this way. This kind of two-tiered system doesn't exist for other, um, other infections. So this test is, is it's specific. It's not going to give you many false negatives. It's not going to tell you you have Lyme when you don't, but it's not very sensitive in this is combined it, fashion. Yeah, because that's one of, the, one of the bigger issues is that uh, a lot of times... Uh, uh, the older tests, they were a lot of false negatives, correct? Like 50% false negative? Right, right. So now we're in a situation where um, we're relying on this test that's probably about 50% reliable. And to go a little bit further back on this, this Western blot, it wasn't really ever designed as a diagnostic test. It was designed as a screening test. And over time, it's been changed. Uh, there's actually been, uh, when they developed the vaccine for Lyme, uh, which was eventually taken off the market uh, because it caused some autoimmune reactions, there was some controversy about it. Um, when they developed the vaccine, they used two of the components uh, or, uh, that, that were, would have showed up on a Western blot. They used two of those components, took them out of the test. So... Um, so people who were vaccinated wouldn't come back positive. And then those components weren't put back in the test. So you're left with kind of this, this uh, really in, uh, unreliable test, unfortunately. So due to the fact that it's unreliable, how, how do you compensate for that? Based on symptoms or? or yeah, uh... so at the end of the day, Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. You have to rely on symptoms and also there are some uh, other tests that you can you can do that uh, that can help you out. So there is another Western blot on the market. It's done by a company called Igenix that's uh, right at the bottom of the, the slide there. And they've taken those two bands, they were taken out of the Western blot, they've put them back in and they through um, you know studies that they've done, which are reliable, um, have established that their Western blots about 98% uh, uh, reliable. And they've actually had outside, you know, third parties send them samples and said, hey, test these 100 samples, and they come back 96, 98% reliable. And they've established their own criteria, their test is more sensitive, um, in that it actually tells you how strong the signal is, not just a yes or no. Um, so if I'm really not sure, I'll go with Igenix. It is out of pocket. There's an expense there. Insurance won't touch it um, for a variety of reasons. And then there's tests uh, you can do with the immune system. So you look at inflammatory markers. You look at what the immune system is doing. There are specific immune deficiencies you see in people with Lyme. Um, 
and uh, with all that pulled together, it's you can establish a diagnosis. And then we get into testing for the other tick-borne diseases. You're relying mostly on these IgG, IgM, so those are the immunoglobulins that the body makes in response to different infections. Uh, IgM is the initial uh, um, immune response the body makes in the first few weeks of an infection. IgG is kind of like the immune system's memory. So uh, those will persist longer. They can both give you information on whether the person is, has the infection currently, whether they've had in the past, or whether it might possibly be a chronic case. And then there are different markers that we can do uh, for both Babesia and Bartonella uh, that can, again, look at the immune system to, uh, to establish whether uh, there are specific types of inflammation, specific types of immune responses that might be stirred up by these different infections. And then you have to look at a host of other things in, in the Lyme patient. So at the end of the day, I tell people Lyme is an inflammatory condition. It's, it, it is an infection, but it's, it's stirring up inflammation and that's, that's the problem. Um, and then you have these kind of, uh, uh, these, these concurrent issues that go on that are very common in, in Lyme patients because of what's going on with the immune system. So Epstein-Barr virus is, one of those things that can come back out. So Epstein-Barr virus is in the herpes family. It lives uh, in your white blood cells after you've had it. Uh, and, and this is the virus that causes mono. So most of us come across, us, uh, come across it in our teens, whether we got mono or not, you test people for Epstein-Barr virus and most of them have some uh, history with it. And I see it's very common in my, uh, my Lyme patients to have a recurrent uh, Epstein-Barr virus or a reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. Mold toxicity, we live in Connecticut. There's mold all over the place. It's, it's wet, we live in old houses. Our basements uh, harbor mold. Uh, it can be a major issue and there's, there's testing you can do there, um, both testing your home uh, for mold, testing uh, the urine for byproducts of mold, and looking at blood markers for, uh, for inflammation that's stirred up by the mold. Food allergies and sensitivities, uh, we'll test for that just to look for other sources of inflammation. What are you putting in your body that's going to cause more inflammation and cause more of an issue? Nutrient status, uh, looking at what you might be deficient in and re replacing that. Assessing the, the gut, so looking at gut integrity, again, that ties in with the food sensitivities where we get leaky gut, our gut isn't kind of uh, filtering things out properly, isn't absorbing nutrients properly, and we're eating foods that are making that worse. You look at the gut microbiome, the bacteria that's supposed to be there, maybe yeast that aren't supposed to be there, bacteria that aren't supposed to be there, and addressing those issues. Heavy metals, in particular mercury, will become an issue with, uh, with Lyme disease. So I utilize uh, some urine testing to see if uh, there's, there's uh, mercury toxicity or other heavy metals like lead and arsenic, uh, cadmium uh, um, additionally. And dental infections. So this is kind of new on my radar, but uh, there's a few biological dentists in the state that are looking in people's uh, teeth for the spirochetes actually living in, uh, especially in the molars and, and having that remediated, uh, which is uh, um, a, a great help to me. Yeah, I actually found when I, when I did go see a natural do uh, dentist that I did have some uh, spirochetes in my, in, my, in my mouth, interesting. Yeah, and they do all sorts of like ozone therapy. Ozone and, therapy, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting stuff. And, and uh, I think we're, we're at the beginning of, of understanding it. Yes. Uh, uh, so basically a lot of the things that you were, you were focusing on were different stressors to, the, to, to your body that when you're under stress, you can't tolerate it with all the other infections, correct? Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly it. So inflammation creates more inflammation. Okay. We re yo, go ahead, sorry. No, you go ahead. 
Yeah. So one of the things, one of the things that we, what we all know is Lyme disease is very difficult to treat, but do you know the reason why, or, or can you talk to us about that? Yeah, it's, it's extremely difficult to treat because it's, it's a very resilient bacteria. So it can do a couple things. Uh, it has a few different defense mechanisms. This bacteria has been around a long time. Um, they, they found it in, uh, um, human samples from 5,000 years ago. It's been around a while and it's developed some defense mechanisms for one uh, with antibiotics specifically. It can create pumps that pump out the antibiotics. Uh, those are called efflux pumps. And with bacteria, uh, since they reproduce so quickly, they're able to pass that information back and forth from bacteria to bacteria, generation to generation very quickly. So you can have over the course of a few days, uh, you know, mutations going on that, that enable the, bac the bacteria to pump out the, the antibiotics. They can also go dormant in the, uh, you know, in the presence of, of, um, of antibiotics. So basically ball themselves up, slow down their, their metabolic rate, so they're not taking in the antibiotics. Um, they also form biofilms, and a lot of bacteria will find, form biofilms, or basically these sticky, uh, globby substances that they can use to kind of wall themselves off and protect themselves. So um, you have all these defense mechanisms, and then once it kind of burrows into tissue, so it gets into the brain, it's hard to get medicine to the brain that's going to kill it off. It gets into the heart. It can cause major inflammation in the heart that can persist for a long time. It will create, you know, joint damage and, and potentially joint destructions over, over time if not treated properly. And um, that's why you have such chronic issues with, with Lyme. Well, one of the other things that I've, I've heard, I don't know if this is, uh, if this is accurate, but the cysts in the egg phase uh, live with inside the cell membrane where the antibiotics can't get in there and actually kill them. And then the adults are the ones that are circulating through the body. Is, it, is that accurate? Right. Because of the reproductive cycle of, of the Lyme, yes. it, it just adds that extra kind of layer. And you'll see different uh, time scales on what that cycle is. We know that people with Lyme can have symptoms that seem to cycle and that gets added on to if they have co-infections that have different life cycles. So that is definitely something to take into account. So we kind of touched on this before. So um, we're looking at the conventional approach uh, to Lyme versus the more integrative approach. And uh, essentially, this is what the CDC says on their facts and myths page that a tick must be attached for 36 hours, not true. And they don't know exactly, there have been other studies done, but if a tick is attached at all, it's a, it's a non-zero chance that you'll be infected. Essentially, any attachment um, is, is potential for infection. Uh, the bullseye rash, uh, basically, uh, they say it happens 70, 80%, it's, it's not that much, it might be, 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and as I said, it doesn't always look like a bullseye. And then we talked about post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And um, right. And they also say that most cases of Lyme disease are successfully treated with a few weeks of antibiotics. And if you go to the CDC website, they have some really nice videos of people who go in, test for Lyme, they're very happy three weeks later and never have to deal with it again. And that's what we hope. You know, you hope to catch it early do the antibiotics, do everything that you can to get rid of it. You never have to deal with it again, and unless you get bitten again. And uh, here's the, this is from the ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society website, ILADS.org. And they're kind of cutting edge on, on chronic Lyme and, and how, to, how to treat Lyme. So um, basically, attachment times under 24 hours, the risk is not zero. And I already mentioned the bullseye rash. And the last bullet point here is important, um, that when you test, when we're looking at a Western blot, again, we're looking at your immune response. Everybody's immune system is different. So, you know, you can look at kind of the typical 
peaks and valleys of when those antibodies form in everybody, but it's not the same for everybody. And you, you can get a lot of false negatives if you just miss it. So testing directly after you get bitten, probably not gonna show anything. Testing a couple weeks later, you have a better chance. And then it's about catching that. that. So I'll, I'll frequently start somebody on treatment if they get bitten, I'll have them call their primary and get on antibiotics, do my treatment, and then uh, and then treat and then test them again a couple weeks later and test them again, you know, just to make sure that we're catching that immune response. And we have our 10 to 21 days. If you do suspect or if you've had a tech, tick bite, you're concerned about Lyme disease, which you should be. Um, 21 days at least of doxycycline. Don't let them give you. A, 10 days or a single dose. They usually get a single dose of, of doxycycline, which does nothing. And, um, and that's a big myth, right? Yeah, it's a big myth. So the, the, uh, the single dose thing came from one small study in New York that didn't follow up well enough. They didn't follow up long enough, basically. Um, so you wanna be on 21 days, maybe even 28 days of, of doxycycline. It depends on what your doctor is comfortable with. And um, another note about the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is, you know, these, these folks who have Lyme in their system for long, long periods of time will end up with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, unspecified autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. I've, I've, I've seen all those things happen in Ner my- Nervous system issues. You know. Major nervous, multiple sclerosis. Yes. I, I've, couple of patients who, who we, we think their MS is related to an old Lyme infection. So um, the treatment approach should be that further treatment of the infection of the bacteria is appropriate. And people do much better if you actually address the root cause, which is what naturopathic medicine is all about. Treat the root cause of the disease, which is the, the bacteria. Now we're going to get into the uh, integrative approach to how I treat things. And uh, basically, we have to treat not just the main infection, treat all the co-infections, address all our sources of inflammation. So we talked about the food sensitivities and allergies, the mold, um, also uh, nutritional deficiencies, the immune system, and detox. And I'll mention the jerish herxheimer reaction. So the jerish herxheimer reaction, or Herx, is when you start treating Lyme or another uh, infection, you may feel worse at the beginning, and that's basically a detox reaction. So Lyme, this is another one of its defense mechanisms, Lyme will release toxins when you kill it, and then your body has to get rid of those toxins. It also has to get rid of dead bacterial tissue. So you can have some pretty um, unpleasant symptoms, and it's usually just a return of your of the symptoms you're already having or an exacerbation. And there are things that you can do, um, and all the all the things that you can do in your um, uh, daily life to uh, to mitigate that, and that's reducing inflammation. So, so now I have a question about the Herx reaction because I was always under the impression that the Herx reaction was was when the bacteria starts to repopulate again meaning that you take the antibiotics, you feel really good, you come off the antibiotics, and then you have a Herx, Herx reaction. Is that, is that not how that where it works? The Herx refers to the die-off reaction. Okay. More the die -off. Have, okay. Yeah, you can certainly have, and, and you see it unfortunately, frequently you certainly have exacerbations if the treatment isn't extended long enough, if you don't catch it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then here are some of the herbs that I use. The, uh, I won't go through each one individually, but just in general. Um, most of uh, my herbal protocols come from Steve at Herod Buner, who's an herbalist. He wrote the book Healing Lyme, which is a really, really good reference. Uh, he also wrote books on Bartonella, Babesia, Mycoplasma. There's actually two different co-infection books um, that combine some of those infections. And um, he'll run you through what all these herbs are doing in detail. So for treating the infections, depending on which infections you, you have, you've got uh, teasel root and hutania, bidens, cryptolepis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
artemisin and sweet annie are reserved for babesia and obviously don't take these things on your own you need some guidance going through this this sort of process um, and we address inflammation with these herbs depending on where it is so japanese knotweed and cat's claw are part of all of my protocols uh, Stefani and kudzu are reserved for neurological inflammation curcumin uh, joint inflammation all of that we support the immune system with adaptogenic herbs uh, and immune supportive herbs. So things that are gonna balance your immune system. So not necessarily things that are gonna ramp it up or, or knock it down, uh, but, but adaptogens, which help you adapt to stress, help your immune system adapt to, uh, to what's going on. And um, it, it all depends on the individual, what they're dealing with, what they're experiencing, which ones, ones of these I, I pick. They're not taking 30 herbs at the same time. And then for the die-off reaction, um, Alka-Seltzer Gold, uh, which is Alka-Seltzer with the aspirin taken out of it, um, helps with that detox reaction. Vitamin C, keeping yourself well hydrated, sweating, getting in a sauna. Uh, Epsom salt baths are great. I recommend them to everybody. Uh, castor oil packs and skin brushing. So these are all just detoxification support. Uh, so if you do have that kind of ramp up of sy symptoms, you can help your body through the process and everybody gets through it. It's, it's unpleasant, uh, but the Herx 50-50 proposition probably lasts a, a week or two for the people that get it. Some people extend beyond that. You'd need to do further support. Uh, just a quick thing, if, if everybody uh, on the bottom of their icons, if they go to the chat area, if they wanted to uh, uh, ask some questions, that's a great place to, to, to start writing and typing questions for the end, okay? Um, now, I understand that when, when you're dealing with a lot of these things, besides taking supplements, vitamins, uh, you know, taking care of yourself, is, are there any other dietary changes that can help recovery from uh, chronic Lyme disease? Yeah, so... Um... Essentially, what you want to do is, I've mentioned anti-inflammatory many times, inflammation many times. Everybody who walks into my office gets an anti-inflammatory diet, and it's, it's tailored to them, but the basics are, um, I prefer a Mediterranean diet. I find it's the easiest to do with our food supply, and, um, and has been shown in studies to be anti-inflammatory. So the focus is on lean protein, um, from poultry, lean red meat. Uh, and this all depends on your individual constitution too and how you handle things. Um, getting enough fiber, eating uh, healthy fats, getting your omega-3 and omega-9 fatty acids from fish and healthy nuts, uh, avoiding the inflammatory fatty acids, um, and getting a wide variety of nutrients through your diet. So focusing on getting a wide variety of vegetables and fruits and color into the diet. And then <clears throat> depending on the patient, you know, you might want to go gluten-free. If you see some signs of gluten intolerance, gluten is a major inflammatory factor. We eat a lot of it. It's a major, major problem. Um, some people might want to go dairy-free. Um, and then other inflammatory foods like soy, sugar, corn, um, alcohol is a, a big issue with Lyme. Uh, people who have, have chronic Lyme tend to get bad hangovers, your sugars. So I go all through, through this in detail, obviously, with all my patients. We spend a lot of time on this, but it's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory diet that's tailored to the individual needs. So basically, be healthy. Be healthy. Maintain a healthy relationship with your body, emotionally, yeah. chemically, physically, and your body will have a better chance of of, of, of being able to fight the, this, 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 this infection. Exactly. And then there's some lifestyle things. Uh, so I mentioned the sugar, the alcohol, the gluten, um, cleaning up the gut. So making sure your gut bacteria is healthy, uh, potentially looking for uh, bad bacteria and yeast in the gut. You can do that through stool tests or, or other methods. Um, probiotics uh, helpful in that regard to repopulate that good gut bacteria. Mentioned the anti-inflammatory diet, getting outside, getting sun, exercise, two-year tolerance. I tell my patients they absolutely can exercise, but they have to figure out their limits. 
And then a uh, big fan of meditation, uh, meditative practices that includes yoga, Tai Chi, I love the float tank, uh, sensory deprivation tank, anything that you can do to, uh, to kind of de-stress, calm things down, uh, will help you get through it because stress is uh, another factor. And I see people who will come in as chronic Lyme <clears throat> solely based on a really stressful event in their life. So it was in, it was in their system for 10 years, but they had the death of a parent. Uh, they had some other, you know, major stressful event in their life and that triggered that, uh, that infection to kind of pop back out and become a problem for them. So stress is a major factor. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. We're going to, we're going to kind of continue this with a few questions that we asked, uh, that have been asked. The first question is from Harry. It says, uh, does Lyme disease have a dormant stage and how soon will symptoms typically show up? And I assume that we're um, assume that we're referring to between the bite and the symptoms. Uh, yeah. Okay. I get it. That's my um, assumption as well. Yeah. Not not really. You see symptoms within uh, within a couple of days generally, um, and that's where you get into. Okay. Should I run to my doctor and get on antibiotics if I have no symptoms? Or and it's a it's a tough decision to make, right? Because you you could have a tick, get it off really quickly, and that's where the testing, you know, having it tested. But the testing also takes a few days, so you kind of there is that kind of period of maybe a few days there where you just don't know between the bite, when was the tick on you, when did you pull it off, when are you going to experience symptoms? Uh, yeah, you probably have a, a just a few days there. It's a good question. Okay. And another question that, that, that we have is, uh, will CBDs help, uh, specifically uh, taking Vitalibus 900, which also contains a couple herbs like uh, frankincense, I'm sorry, uh, essential oils like frankincense, myrrh, and cordialis. Uh, will that help with inflammation and blow flow to reduce the swelling? I actually saw a, a really interesting study today about... Um, Myrrh, this is, uh, might, might be on, or, uh, I'll get back on topic in a second, that actually had some inhibitory, uh, uh, some, some qualities that inhibit the, the Lyme bacteria itself. But yeah, CBD oils would definitely be part of a, um, that, uh, A, the, the de-stressing part, the anxiety part of it, you know, the, uh, the people who have any sort of neurological um, manifestations because the CBD is neuroprotective, right? And uh, also, you know, blood flow is really important. You have to get those herbs to the uh, to where they need to get to, get those medicines to where they need to get to. Um, so yeah, CBD would be a uh, would be a potential component of of any uh, Lyme protocol. Wonderful, and that's what just to help with the uh, stress level, the stress on the body, and help the body to get into the state of rest, recovery, and yeah, and kind of heal faster. Right, what we're talking about with either the adaptogenic herbs or the meditative practices, just kind of leveling things out and, and helping the body respond to stress and respond to uh, to uh, everything that that uh, is being stirred up by the the infection. Looks like we have one last question, and I'll, I'll read it. Uh, are there any vaccines currently in development for Lyme disease? So, so okay. <clears throat> The and issue with the my favorite topic either, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, the, the the interesting thing about vaccines is our dog, you know, your dog gets one, and that's kind of uh, dogs are better protected than we are, unfortunately. But yeah, the Lyme Rix vaccine, which was taken off the market, the reason so there 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 were some adverse reactions, right? Oh, and I should start to start by saying I'm not an anti vax person. So I just want to throw that on the table. Uh, I do have some trepidation, some concerns about the way that we administer antibiotics uh, in our current regimen, but that's a conversation for another uh, another Absolutely. webinar. Right? Absolutely. So the Lymerix vaccine caused some reactions. Uh, there were potential lawsuits and, and the people who made it got spooked and that has not worn off yet. Uh, so there has, you know, every once in a while you hear, hear about uh, a new vaccine being developed. There is research ongoing. I was reading about that 
the other day. Uh, I don't recall who's doing it, but most pharmaceutical companies don't see that it's worth the risk because you have something that spreads slowly in a sense because it doesn't spread person to person, although I won't get into that. Um, it's a very slow moving infection, right? And if the CDC is still saying that it's perfectly curable with three weeks of antibiotics, yeah. then the risk kind of outweighs the benefit for any company who wants to develop a vaccine. But um, there is one thing that you stated that, that, the, the, uh, about, uh, you know, the companies not wanting to assume any risk. They don't have to assume risk in our country with vaccines because they're, they're under the, the guise that they don't have to, there's the NDIC and the other, other things. So they don't have those particular guises to worry about. So obviously mm -hmm. there's more issues with it if they're not producing one topic for another webinar but yes thank you yeah that that is that that is a good point um so right now i don't know if there's anything currently in development um but uh, it was such a, a bad experience the first time around and i mentioned person to person uh uh transmission i didn't want to leave that hanging there is some evidence that it's actually transmitted as well um so i just wanted to throw that out i didn't want to leave that dangling i have had married couples and and uh um such who come in with the same, uh, the seemingly the same strains, the same symptom pictures, uh, the same co-infections, and uh, it could be coincidental. You know, they they share a dog, they share ticks, uh, but uh, there seems to be some evidence that it is sexually transmitted as well. Oh, perfect. Well, that looks like all the questions there, Dr. Keith. Uh, really appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, uh, and it was very informative, and I, I'd like to thank thank Keith for, for for coming on and giving us a whole overview on on Lyme disease. Thank you for having me. It was fun, and thank you for everybody for joining us. Thank you. All right, guys.